My name is Elliot Petty. I'm a senior hydraulic modeler and hydrologist at Jacobs. I have over six years experience in fluvial and pluvial hydraulic modeling and hydrology, uh, having delivered a, a wide range of studies of varying complexity for both public and private sector clients. I've been involved in and I'm currently involved in numerous projects, including modeling, flood risk mapping and flood alleviation appraisal. But really re relevantly, uh, this experience has included lots of uh, detailed modeling of overland flows, um, especially in 2D. So hopefully this puts me in a good position to be uh, presenting today. So this uh, webinar will last about 30 minutes, um, just a bit of a slide here on, on, on what I'm going to cover in that time. So just a bit about why we might want to use 2D modeling at all um, and, and how we might go about that in, in flood modeler. The, the, the kinds of solvers we, we have available in Flood Modeler, so um, are three solvers plus, plus GPU. Um, different model components, so we've got these solvers, but what kind of information do we need to, to give Flood Modeler to, for, for these solvers to, to work? Uh, and also a bit around um, different features in Flood Modeler that allow you to really easily and quickly uh, build, run, and, and, and analyze uh, your models. There'll also be a bit of a demonstration. This will be split into two parts. Um, partly will be pre-recorded because I'm going to run a model on there. And then the second half will be a bit of a live demonstration to go through some of the some of the model outputs. Towards the end, we'll go through the, the new release of Flood Modeler as well, version 6.1. Um, that has various uh, upgrades, if you like, uh, changes for, for our 2D modeling. So good ones having this, this webinar. And then at the end, there'll be time for, for question and answers. So if you put questions in the chat, that'll be that'll be the time that they, they get answered. So without further ado, why might we want to 2D model? Um, so primarily, from, from my experience anyway, um, you'd want to 2D model in places where you've got quite complex flow paths. So where you're not 100% sure where the water's going to go. So if it's maybe an urban area with lots of little back streets and complex uh, complex topography, different slopes and different directions and that kind of thing. So so you want the model really to go out and do all the hard work for you, do all that calculating for you rather than you sort of interrogating LIDAR and that kind of thing. You might also want to apply 2D modeling in areas of rapid change in flow or water level um, and also for, for things like surface water where you perhaps don't have a clear flood mechanism in terms of um, the water's going to pop out of a manhole but then you're not really 100% sure where it's going to go from there. Uh, in, in contrast to say um, a 1D channel uh, where you kind of know it's, it's going to be going probably well in all likelihood upstream to downstream um, but not all solvers do the right do, do the same same job um, you need to pick pick the right one for whatever you, you're trying to achieve so just a, a, a bit of a rundown of different kind of practical applications of 2D modeling um, you may be particularly interested in, in velocities, especially spatially distributed velocities um, for things like incident management planning or perhaps um, erosion management and things like that. So when you want to have your, your safe evacuation route, so you want to see maybe your foul egg in your channel kind of thing. Um, so you might want to see your velocities, a huge variety of other applications too. So I've just focused on, on velocities there, but you can also do things like feasibility studies, optioneering, pre and post scheme uh, assessments and, and things for insurance or exposure premiums or so perhaps you're interested in things like hazard um, and other loads of other stuff like raising community awareness uh, and development planning zoning. So basically where you need a 2D output. Down the right hand side there, um, we've got some, some applications in a table, huge range of applications. You know, uh, this is definitely not an exhaustive list. I mean, we even got Tsunami down at the bottom there. I mean, I'm assuming most of the attendees are, are based in Europe in the UK today. Um, not really known for our tsunamis, but flood modeler can do it if you if you uh, if you need it. So, what are the benefits to 2D modeling? Well, I think the primary one, especially in flood modeler, is it's really easy to set this up. Lots and lots of tools um, to help you build your model really quickly and easily. Um, but also good synergy with readily available data sets. So in the UK, things like LiDAR DTMs are freely available online, and that's a key component of a 2D model. And as I suggested earlier, uh, earlier in the slides, you want your 2D model to be doing all the hard work for you, it distinguishing all those complex flow paths that you might need to, to understand better, so greater level of precision. 
And because you've got that extra dimension on, on your 2D in comparison to your 1D, it can be a bit more accurate and you get that sort of velocity depth variation on the floodplain and you know, your, your depth average velocity and uh, spatially, spatially varying depth. Um, and really handily as well, you know, common common output of any kind of modeling and in flood risk management in general, a key data set is your flood maps, your, your depths, velocities, water levels, things like that, um, and, and also your checks. So quality quality of your model, um, indicate quality indicators for your for your model. And that's all sort of directly output by flood models. So no no real sort of faffing around trying to post process, uh, post simulation process any any kind of data. And the really neat thing about flood model as well is um, you can really easily um, and readily integrate your 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 1D solvers, the the urban and river, with with the 2D solvers as well. So it's really really straightforward. So you might have your, your typical usage, you know, 1D channel with uh, with uh, with uh, with, a, with a 2D floodplain or perhaps a a, a culvert um, with with a series of manholes in 1D, and then your your 2D surface on on top of that. So really easy to to blend the two together if if you want. So a bit more about 2D modeling and flood modeler. As I said before, there's, you, we've got the, the 1D river solver, the 1D urban solver, and a range of 2D solvers. And all of this is accessible through a really modern and integrated work, work, uh, workspace um, interface. Um, you can see on the, the right-hand side, there's your, the ribbon at the top there. And the 2D build ribbon, which we're most interested in, is, is really, really easy to use. Um, Quite useful tools in the form of WMS and WFS, so you can um, add in sort of base mapping as standard uh, just through through a drop down list, really easy click of a button type type addition. Um, and coming soon in version 6.1, so the next version of Flood Modeler, you'll have access to web feature service as well, so WFS, um, and that'll be various things like the the, the flood map for planning, um, hydrometric data points, and things like that. So linking to freely available data sets online. Um, through through a, again through a, through a menu in in Flood Modeler, which is really useful. Um, as many of you might know, when you're building a flood model, um, lots and lots of different files and and formats and multiple different components to your model. Um, and and Flood Modeler has a really great catalog tool that allows you to eat more easily manage all those data sets in, in one through in one place through one interface. And a fairly recent development. Um, it's quite handy as well. The, the Python a API really closely linked to the enhanced productivity tools. So if you've got your own sort of Python workflows and you want to integrate elements of, of the Flood Model toolbox or Flood Modeler itself in you know, the solver, then you can access and sort of plug your plug 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 a plug Flood Modeler into your your Python workflows and that kind of thing. So it's quite useful. But there's also uh, enhanced productivity tools, so toolboxes and things like that, also within. Flood modeler. I mean, there's so many to talk about. I couldn't possibly cover them in the time I've got available, so it's well worth checking them out. But really importantly, Flood modeler is robust. It is quick and it is reliable. It's benchmarked and it's been approved for use by the Environment Agency, CEPA, Natural Resources Wales, and uh, the Office of Public Works in Ireland too. So um, you know, we would tell you, I would tell you, it's good, but uh, you know, it's used by other organisations as well. So, alluded to um, solvers on, on the previous slide. So, there are four solvers available in Flood Modeler. Um, these are solving the, the, the 2D shallow water equations, and we're, we're doing that in a variety of ways here. Um, so, there's three CPU solvers in the form of FAST, ADI, and TVD. And then there's a GPU solver as well. I think that's available already, um, but um, it, it's going to be made available for general release in version 6.1. So let's focus on the CPU solvers. Firstly, we have fast. That really does what it says on the tin. It's very, very fast, but it's fast at a compromise for some kind of physical accuracy or physical uh, physics included in the in the in the equation. Not to say that it gives you a bad answer, but it doesn't include things like momentum in its uh, calculations. It's just mass conserving. Um, so there is a compromise there. But that might be good enough. Typically, um, you would would want to use that fast solver in for, for very fast runtimes, so things like flood forecasting, or where you just need an approximate answer. So perhaps you're doing a sort of initial investigation, you, you're not sure whether you want to go on and do a, a more detailed model run. Second option is the ADI solver. Now this is much more, well, it has more physical attributes to it. So it's calculating, it does include things like momentum in its, uh, its equations. 
you want to use ADI in situations where you've got quite a flat floodplain, you've not got big shocks in water level. Um, so basically, you know, your typical floodplain scenario where it's very flat. TVD as an alternative has even more physical components to it. Um, and it's uh, it can be used in basically in, in any situation. It can be used on flat floodplains, steep, steep valleys or areas where you've got uh, water shocks or levee break or anything like that. The reason you might not want to use TVD on a flat floodplain in comparison to ADI is that TVD does require a, a smaller time step to run stably, so it takes a bit longer in CPU. So you might want to balance the two solvers off depending on your situation, but really easy to, to do that in, in Flood Modeler. Final column there in the table, we've got GPU. Now GPU is the best of all worlds. It, it blends a really fast runtime with a high degree of, of physics included. I'll talk about that a bit more on the next slide. So the TUD GPU solver will become available in version 6.1 or at least uh, through general release in version 6.1. This actually applies the TVD solver that I talked about in the previous slide um, in exactly the same way. There's absolutely no real change in the way the TV, TVD solver operates or the way you need to set the model up. Um, you literally just click a radio button in the XML, so your, your flood model a control file, and just that, that, that's it. You just tell it it's GPU. You don't have to do anything else. Um, great news is it's included as standard with the professional unlimited edition licenses, so you don't have to pay any extra if you've got those licenses. GPU will, will just become freely available to you through uh, up, up, upgrading your flood modeler version. Um, as you can see on the, the, the figure and the slide, uh, the, the figure and the table below here, um, on the left and the right hand side here, um, massive time savings uh, for, for GPU versus CPU. I think. I think key one there is the, the bottom line of the right hand table, We've got 3 million 2D cells, um, which uh, typically on CPU would take about four days to run, but actually on GPU in our benchmark testing took 43 minutes. So really amazing time savings there. So really, really, uh, really good. Um, and the, the larger the model, so the more cells you have, the more calculations the modeler is doing, the greater the time saving. If you want to check out some of our benchmarking results, do go to uh, floodmodeler.com forward slash benchmarking to have a have a look. Version 6.1 um, hasn't been released yet, but I think it is coming soon. So uh, do uh, do keep a look out for that. So we've talked a bit about the solvers and that kind of thing. So what do we need to give our solvers to allow them to calculate an answer for us, give us a water level? Um, well, key one really is topography. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you can get hold of LiDAR quite quite readily in the UK, quite lucky. So you need a surface for your water to flow down. Um, otherwise, it can't, can't, doesn't really know where the water will be going. It doesn't have any topography or any slope values to really uh, calculate that kind of thing. You might want to supplement your, your LiDAR with any kind of site-specific information. Perhaps you have specific surveys, such as top of bank survey or, or crest survey of a, of a, of a defense, perhaps. And you can, you can modify your, your DTM in Flood Modeler using, you know, using that additional information. Another key component is floodplain roughness. So what kind of resistance is the surface um, to, to the flow passing over the surface? Um, this can be Manning's or Chesi. Um, it can be uh, spatially varying or constant value. So um, quite flexible really in terms of floodplain roughness. But of course we need a boundary condition. We need to add some water to our model. Uh, we need some inflows. Again, this is fairly flexible. You can link your inflows to IED files, so standard uh, flood modeler event files. Um, but you also need to um, have a boundary in there perhaps to allow your water to exit the model. So you might want some kind of normal depth or head time boundary to allow your, your, your flows to, to leave the model in some way. So it's not just about inflows, but also perhaps an, an exit as well, a, a way out of the model. Got initial conditions in here, which aren't essential for the 2D solver. Um, if you think about a typical floodplain situation with a river beside it, um, it does start dry typically, so it, 2D solver can can start from dry, but you might want some initial conditions in places where perhaps you have a water body, um, so a lake or a, um, or some kind of pond or something like that, something that would uh, store water on the floodplain. So you might want to apply a sort of initial initial level in in that water body prior to starting your run. It's totally possible to do that in flood modeler. And of course, we need some runtime data. So we need to tell the model how long to run for. You know, how, when's it going to start? When's it going to finish? The solvers require time steps. So that's both CPU and GPU. Um, so you need to tell it 
which kind of what kind of time step we need um you know how, how often do we want it to make a calculation ideally we need some kind of data that we can come so so data related to real life events that we can compare our results to so your model might be created and you might be happy with its mass balance all the components of the model you, you're totally satisfied that your model is is operating very smoothly and giving you you know a, a highly convergent answer perhaps um but it doesn't really mean that much unless you can compare it to real life data um appreciate it's not always possible but it is is very worth very much worth trying to maximize your usage of a uh, of real world data to to corroborate your results so what kind of features do we have to allow us to um sort of build for, for model 2d models within for modeler um well i think i kind of talked about this a little bit before but the there's a really intuitive and customizable interface um, and the parameters are really easy to change you know you can just open a window and change the number and, and that's it um, lots of inbuilt tools to instantaneously develop model components and I'll, I'll show you briefly about that in the demo so it is really is a case of just clicking a button and uh, starting to draw there's no no real faffing around with empties or copying different files and attributes and things like that Flow modeler really kind of does the hard work for you really quick linking as well um, this is 1d 2d link line generator which is really really useful and um, because not only does it generate your your um, your link lines and say you've got a, a river to flood plane scenario it, it snaps that to your top of bank you can also um attribute add add, add, add a z values to your elevation into your into your link line as well so it's just one line there's no messing around sort of snapping different lines to each other and that kind of thing it, you get this one this one line and this tool really helps you do that um quite quickly and we talked about the different solvers before um it's really easy to apply multiple solvers when you've got you know your horses for causes situation you maybe want your adi in one situation tvd in another and you might you might want both of those in the same model but it's really really easy to uh to change those uh, it's just simply a case of going to a drop down menu and selecting one or or the other so time for a bit of a demo so uh you want to go through the uh the basic components of a full model a 2d model set a run going and then show you some results we've got my fmpx file open here and this refers to various different um layers so you don't have to load each of your 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 model components in separately or anything like that you can just just uh use one file and open that and it drags everything else in with it so i've got my terrain data in the form of lidar i've got an active area in yellow i've got a flood defense in dashed red I've got a roughness patch in sort of purple brown uh, and a, an inflow boundary in red just along the edge of my active area and then also a very small embedded culvert through see an embankment here through a, a raised structure not 100 percent sure what that raised structure is I have got some backdrop mapping that might tell me but I can't actually see it through the DTM so let's have a look how I can change that. So I've just double clicked there, gone to symbology, visual style. So let's, let's see where I want to put this, maybe 50%, maybe. Yeah, it's about right. So I can see there I've got my dismantled railway. And actually there's a, a channel running through here, which is what my my culvert, my embedded embedded structure is is representing. It's really easy to create these components. Um, so for example, let me create a another another defense somewhere. So I've just pressed, gone to the, the top here, the 2D build, polyline, topographic features. I'll just go test, test, O3, save. So the edit mode has now started and I just press line. There we go. Double click to end, left click to start, double click to end, and let's add some arbitrary heights in very very high flood defense here if i press enter and close this stop the edit our layer is complete so if i just go back and look at the attributes right click show attributes there we go so how do we tie all of these bits of data together well we do it in an xml file if i open that up it's a, effectively a control file for our simulation giving our, our a giving flood modeler um all the information it needs to to run a model 
We've got a start and a finish time. Finish time is based on the length of inflow, but um, I will get onto that in a second. We've got our domains, really easy to add a new domain. Domain four, and then add a solver. Maybe I go TVD this time, press OK, and there you go. And you just click and drag elements of your model into there. So pretty easy. I'm not going to do roughness on this occasion, but hopefully demonstrated you know, how easy that is. If I press remove, easy enough to remove it as well. But I have a pre-prepared domain with all my bits and pieces in here. I don't want test because I haven't got it referred to in here. So I'm just going to remove that and then I'm going to add my, my test 03. We've got a grid size of four and a time step of two. Typically you want a, a grid size, a time step that's half the grid size. I've got my active area here. 03, this yellow one. And I'll just click and drag that back into here. Don't worry about any of these parameters. They are automatically changed with the active area. And then I've got my roughness below uh, referencing to, to an external file. So you can have a list of roughnesses um, and a shape file varying across the active area, um, referring to different roughnesses in, in the lookup file, which is quite useful. And then we've got a background value as sort of a, a unique, uh, well, a, a ubiquitous almost value throughout the model um, of 0.1. We've got some boundary conditions. So we've got an inflow. This is this red line around the outside here. And this inflow, you could have your time series. You can manually put in a value if you want. And um, you could have a constant flow, but that's not really realistic of a, a typical sort of fl flood hydrograph. And here, actually, I'm referring to an external IED. So just as you build a 1D model and have an IED, you can do exactly the same here. So this this uh, red line doesn't refer to the IED. It actually refers to the node within the IED. Um, so I've got uh, an ID called QT01. I also have an inflow node called QT01, and that's what's referred to in this line. So if I just open that up to show you, there's my node reference. My IED reference is in the control file, and my node is here. I've just loaded in you know, event data as as normal. If I just open that up, there's our inflow hydrograph. So we've got topography, roughness, we've got grid sizes, time steps, active areas, boundaries. You can see how quickly you can uh, develop a lot of uh, a lot of files in a 2D model. We're not really interested in our rainfall infiltration um, on this occasion, but you can add you know, uh, rainfall polygons and that kind of thing uh, to apply rainfall across an area, or you can apply infiltration across an area. We've got our 1D structure, really easy to add add that you can use the 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 1d structure wizard to create a new shape file there's then a further series of steps that hopefully fairly explanatory if self-explanatory to uh, help you build your structures many structures perform exactly the same way as 1d um as 1d 1d models so um the the the, the nodes look exactly the same so you can add you know an aura face or culvert in the same way as you would in the 1d model and then again, you just click and drag straight into your embedded 1D structures. We've then got outputs. I'm quite happy with these outputs. I'm going to output every hour. I'm going to output SMS grid, so my, my DAT files. I've got 15 hour runtime, so it's going to be 15 time steps on the output for that. And then I've got a max grid to in my sort of max ASCII grid. Down the right hand side, I can select what kind of parameters I want to output. Um, oh, um, and um, so maybe I want depth, elevation, flow, velocity there, but maybe I also want fruit. Maybe I want the negative depths as well. Got mass balance at the bottom here. Really important for your model. If, if you've got a low mass mass balance, you've probably got a well a well calculating model. You've probably got a bit more confidence in it. You can also have things like flow lines, hazard settings, shear stress settings, if 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 applicable. Next tab, we've got some options where you can change the scheme. So you can maybe change the TVD. Or, or fast or GPU, whatever you whatever you want. Typically don't change these parameters unless I really, really have to. Um, and on this occasion, I don't I don't think I do. So I've got what I need. I've got all my parameters in here. So let's press run. OK, so I press run. Um, and now we're going to have a look at some of the results. So this is this part of the demo we're going to cover really um, you know, what kind of things might you want to check when, you, when your, your model is complete. So I'm just going to load up uh, the example 
workspace. So here we go. So hopefully these files are all all familiar to you. Um, we've got our our active area, uh, a roughness polygon, uh, a boundary, inflow boundary, a, a culvert, an embedded culvert, um, defense, and then an extra extra uh, test line that I added prior to that. So once your simulation is is finished, you probably want to start checking things like uh, mass balance and and uh, convergence. So you want to make sure you, your model is actually coming up with a stable answer. Um, so they're the kind of things you want to really have a look at first. Um, but the modeler produces two two folders following the the, the completion of a run. Uh, one is probably typically labeled O1. The other one's labeled O2. In O1, we've got our time series data. So we've got flow through our embedded culvert at the top here. And we've got um, our sort of time stepwise output, our stepwise output, our, our time time varying output, excuse me. And then we've got various check files in here too. In the second folder, it's our maximum outputs. So uh, depth, flows, velocities as, as, as maximums. So I'm assuming that I'm, you know, I'm fairly satisfied with mass balance and things like that on this occasion. So um, I'm actually going to just look at key modifications that I made to this model, so topography and and roughness. So to do that, I'm going to load this uh, frick.asc file and zmod.asc Z file. Load those both in. Here we go. So let's look at the roughness first. So if I just take these off and move our roughness patch to the top here. And you can see actually our check is recording this change here that I, I applied. So how do we know if it's applying the right value? Well, we can we go to map tools and plot section and then press draw because I just want to draw freehand. In here we can see if I select this correct one. There we go. So we can see our 0 0.1. If you if you remember back to the recording, you can I applied a, a constant value of, of 0 0.1, but then I've got a modification here of, of one to represent a very very high level of resistance and you can see based on this 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 cross-section plot that's successful it has applied what I, I intended it to apply so if I close this now and look at my Zmod check so you can see here I've got two lines I've got my tests and then I had a, a linear defense if you like around on the bottom here in right angles so let's just check that that is actually doing what we think it should be doing so if I just add these back on and my tests as well I'm just going to use the inquisition tool here, the information tool. Let's have a look. So what have I got going on here? So my Zmod is suggesting that I've applied a value of 21 and seen here. So let's go to my modification layer. So my test 03. And you can see here I've got a height of 21. So I've drawn from left to right. So height one is left hand side, height two is right hand side. I've got a value of 21 here, which is great. So that means I'm I'm applying that first point correctly, and then I've got my second point here, 23, and yeah, again, 23. So this is doing what I think it should be, and then a bit of interpolation in between. So I've got a, a Zmod check a, a check file saying it's 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 reading in a value of 21.97, which is part way between 21 and 23. So if I zoom out and do the same thing for the other defense line, I think this is a flat line. So here we've got a value in the middle of the line of 12.6 meters above datum. If I go up to the defense line one at the top here, again, 12.6. So good news. I'm uh, pretty happy. Um, I, these modifications, the roughness and topographic modifications are, are applied correctly. You don't have to check these at the end. Um, something I do typically is, um, is, is run the model to initiation. So when it's first started running a time step, these kind of check files are, are written at that point, and you can check these kind of things at that point before you, you know, you embark on a model run and wait all this time for your, your results to arrive. And um, so, um, yeah, well worth having a look at these checks um, before you start interrogating results, so your 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 animations or anything like that, or your your max outputs to make sure that the model is doing exactly what you think it should be. Very easy to. Um, you might just have a bad day or just it's just one of those things you know where you, you think you've applied something and you you're hundred percent certain of it I mean but you go back to the check files and find that you know it isn't quite how you intended so it's always worth uh, going through those checks and, and balances to make sure your model's doing doing what you think it should be 
haven't really got time unfortunately to go through any any results this time but um there's loads of help out there online through the help system and things like that helps help and guide and step step by step guidance as well so feel free to to explore that and uh, have a have a bit of look further so let's go back to the presentation then so just a little bit more about um version 6.1 um particularly pertinent to the overland flow webinar because lots of new features uh, related to the 2d model and the gpu component as well in version 6.1 so we're going to generally release the, the the gpu solver as we've seen in the previous slides it offers really massive time savings so it's really really worth having a look at but there's also various other new 2d features that are going to be made available as well that are worth checking out um, to make make your life as a modeler a bit easier as through our light standard and professional editions uh, we're now going to provide up to 300 percent more 2d cells um, enabling you to model larger catchments but if you want also to have finer resolutions over the same area there's going to be a bit of a price reduction as well so our annual subscription license is reducing in cost by up to 40 percent um, and there's loads more stuff coming as well um, so improved hydrology methods for modeling the impacts of snow melt um, and as I talked about earlier, there's access to uh, web feature service layers, your WFS layers, and more robust data management solutions. So loads of things out there. Again, quite a short webinar today, so I don't really have time to go through it all as much as I'd like to. Um, but again, find out more information on, on flumodeler.com. And I really would recommend looking at you know, the, the help system and the guidance as well and all the different. There's loads of YouTube videos and things like that to go and have a look at. So lots of information there to uh to to support your learning and investigation into this software a bit more 